bad where we end up with, you know, when you start getting heavy on gear and everything. But still, um, yeah. Better not. Better just keep them. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, the North Koreans kind of said the same thing. They were like, look, you suckers. You know, it's literally, at least the North Koreans are, you know, open to that.
Response to the whole thing about Jesus Christ. Yeah. Can't be there on that. <laughs> no, we'll start, we'll, we'll start in the back. That class will just go to lunch. Maybe once he's out. I think the, you know the rule is once all the seats are filled, we're we're ready to start. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Ben Valentino. I'm a professor in the government department here at uh, Dartmouth and the coordinator of the Dickey Center's War and Peace Studies uh, program. And it's my privilege tonight to introduce to you Mark Lynch, uh, uh, who will be speaking. Um, is he here? Uh, uh, in our uh, War and Peace Studies uh, seminar series. This is, uh, we tend to have one of these uh, per term, so this is our first uh, of this academic year. Mark is a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University, where he is the director of the Institute for Middle East Studies and uh, the project on Middle East political science. Uh, Mark is probably known to many of you, but uh, to those of you who he is not, um, he's widely recognized as one of America's leading thinkers on the contemporary politics of the Middle East. He's published articles um, beyond counting on the subject, but I can't count the number of major books on the subject, and I think it's three with a fourth um, on the way uh, in just the last 12 years. Um, perhaps the most notable of these um, is the 2012 book that he wrote on the Arab Spring titled Arab Uprisings, The Unfinished Revolutions of the New Middle East, which draws on in-depth interviews with American officials and firsthand um, uh, interviews with protesters, politicians, and diplomats uh, from the Middle East. It's a really good read, uh, and I recommend it to you highly. Uh, a review of the book uh, in The Economist uh, last year called it one of the most illuminating and for policymakers the most challenging books written on the Arab Spring. In fact, uh, although I didn't know this before I put together this bio for his introduction, um, Mark is credited with coining the term the Arab Spring um, as the first one to use it um, in a blog post um, in January of 2011. One of the hallmarks of uh, Mark's work has been the attention that he gives to new media and social media, uh, like Twitter and Facebook and uh, in the Middle East, Al Jazeera, both uh, on TV and on the internet, and how those forces have shaped the contemporary politics of the Middle East. And so it's probably not a coincidence either that in addition to studying um, how the internet affects uh, politics, Mark has used uh, the internet uh, to some effect to um, disseminate his own ideas. Over the last decade, um, Mark has been one of the most important voices um, in the United States um, uh, on uh, Middle Eastern politics. And his blog, which uh, began in all the way back in 2002, before uh, maybe even the word blog was widely used to describe these things, um, has uh, been one of the most respected and widely used sources for journalists, um, uh, policymakers, and the general public for trying to understand um, the complicated politics of the Middle East. Uh, Mark is also the director, this I found out uh, while researching his bio, um, of the Blogs and Bullets project at the United States Institute of Peace, which sounds like an extremely interesting project designed to map out online discourse in places like um, Egypt uh, and Syria where there are ongoing military conflicts um, to understand how the public is uh, reacting and how those conflicts are evolving. So that's a long way of saying um, just how lucky we are to have uh, Professor Lynch with us today. He's going to talk about developments in the Arab world since the Arab Spring, uh, uh, the, those uprisings of 2010 and 2011. It's hard to think of a more important and timely subject uh, for us to hear about, and it's hard to think of anyone who's in a better position to tell us about them than Mark. So Mark, welcome. All right, thanks, Ben. And thanks um, to all of you for coming out. Um, it's great to have a chance to be here at Dartmouth and to talk about this. Because um, I, I think that um, this is awfully loud. How's that? Um, 
So because I think right now, I think everybody who follows the region would probably agree that um, this, is a, this is a fairly dark time um, in the Middle East. And you know, when I was writing the book, uh, The Arab Uprising, and uh, when I was going out and giving a lot of talks about the Arab Uprising over the last year or two, um, generally, this is a pretty optimistic and uh, you know, kind of happy thing to be talking about. This was a story of liberation, of transformation, of change, of uh, people throwing off the legacies of decades of the stultifying dead hand of Arab authoritarianism and giving themselves the chance uh, to, to build something new. And uh, then, you know, with the summer break, you know, don't give any talks because it's summer. Um, come back to the fall, and at this point, it's kind of hard uh, for many people to either give or to receive uh, an optimistic talk about what's happening in the Arab world right now. And uh, for those of you who follow this uh, in a casual way, or those of you who follow it deeply, I mean, again, the, so the, the, the places where you're going to find grounds for optimism are pretty few and far between. In, in Tunisia, where it all began, uh, you have perhaps the most optimistic uh, still, but you know, basically uh, high degrees of political polarization, a government which is about to resign or not resign, depending on the time of day, and um, persistent uh, institutional, uh, economic, and uh, you know, all kinds <laughs> of failures across the board, even in the great shining success story of the Arab Spring. Um, in uh, Libya, the state uh, which was, or the, what was sort of a state under Gaddafi, which uh, uh, was crushed, has not reconstituted itself. I was just reading on, uh, on my Twitter feed shortly before coming over here uh, a report that uh, armed gunmen broke into the central bank and uh, walked off with $55 million in hard currency. Um, whether that's better or worse than armed gunmen kidnapping the prime minister and holding him hostage, um, I'll leave it uh, to you to decide the relative merits. But um, Libya is not looking uh, like it's turning into a Weberian uh, nation state anytime soon. Egypt, which is really at the heart of everything that we focused on when we talked about the Arab Spring, um, was carrying on with its rickety, uh, you know, really poorly done, uh, really horribly done uh, transition until the military decided to step in and have a military coup and then uh, crush uh, the counter protesters in a bloody show of force. Um, and in my opinion, I'll go into this in more detail in a few minutes, but I think really basically breaking Egyptian politics for the next two to five years and destroying any hopes of a meaningful democratic transition there. And then, and, and actually, the, the Maghreb is actually the positive side. Because in the Gulf, uh, there's been uh, basically, well, the Gulf isn't doing too well. And then you go up into the Levant, and it's downright apocalyptic with a stalled uh, peace process. Uh, and Syria and the sectarian civil war in Syria basically dragging the entire region down more and more into the abyss. This is not a happy time for, uh, for people who study the Middle East, who live in the Middle East, who work on the Middle East, or hope for something better to come out of the Arab Spring. So that, that's, that's the, uh, the, the kind of the negative context where we begin uh, talking about this today. That said, I'm not ready to go completely doom and gloom on this yet or to declare that the Arab uprisings failed, whatever that might mean. Because when I think about the Arab uprising or what I un unfortunately uh, once called the Arab Spring, um, that, it was a blog post and I was basically saying it wasn't an Arab Spring, but Google is unforgiving. Um, so yes. Um, when I, when I looked at this, and I think a way to look at this and to not give in to existential despair is to see what happened in this so-called Arab Spring of early 2011 as a unique and extraordinary moment in a process that was developing for decades. In other words, it didn't come out of nowhere, and it hasn't ended. It was a kind of a spike and now a trough but in a process which is very much one of structural change and transformation in the region. And these structural changes are profound and deep. I do think that they are driven by and shaped by information technology and by the media. That's been the main focus of my work, but that's of course not the only thing that's going on. The key thing to keep in mind, and this is where I'm going to, this is my, my launching off point for talking about what's going on in the region now, and it's where I'm gonna conclude, is 
that these changes are so profound and so deep that there's no going back to the way things used to be, even if we would like there to be. In other words, the transformations have to do with the fundamental nature of the relationship between citizens and the state and the ability of states to control their populations. And that has fundamentally changed. And that change has been developing over decades, not over two years. And so the setback that we're currently going through, it seems to me, is part of this process of, of often increasingly violent, difficult, turbulent, contentious transformation. But the process of transformation um, continues. And I think that the idea that it can be controlled by American foreign policy, by the Egyptian military, by Al Qaeda, by anybody is simply wrong. People will adapt more or less effectively to these transformations. Some groups, some forces, some ideas will be privileged, some will fail, but the underlying structural forces continue to unfold. So what are those structural forces? Um, a big part of the changes that I see really do have to do with, again, media and information technology in the sense of the effects that they have on the ability of states to control their societies and to shape the way individuals interact with each other. Now, if you go back and, and looking around the room, I know at least some of you uh, have experienced, lived in the Middle East in the 1970s, 1980s, and you know what it was like back then when states were able to maintain a stifling conformity uh, in public and over the flow of information and the expression of opinion. If you lived in some place like Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, if you lived in these countries back then, even into the early 1990s, you were in places where states were able to fundamentally control the information to which their citizens had access. They could control the ability to know what was going on, not just you know, in distant parts of the world, but even like across, you know, in, in two neighborhoods away. Um, they did this through censorship and control of information, through state ownership of the media, newspapers and television, um, and through uh, extremely intrusive and invasive systems of control, intelligence services, uh, the all-pervasive Khabarad General Intelligence Directorate, who, which were able to maintain stifling systems of fear and control, which made people, number one, even if, so number one, they couldn't get access to information, but even if they could get access to it, they wouldn't dare talk about it in public. Sure, there were always a couple of extraordinarily brave dissidents who might um, raise their voices, challenge the status quo um, in, uh, in, in their attempt to draw attention to the problems of their societies, and you would often know them by the fact that they were dead or in exile because it was extraordinarily pervasive, violent, and intrusive, the, the extent to which these governments would um, control information and opinion. Um, uh, there was a, a, a well-known uh, Jordanian critic uh, back in the early 1980s who wrote about this, uh, and, the, and the, 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 um, the phrase that always stuck with me was the idea of a scissors in my brain. In other words, the sensor scissors weren't just on the newspaper, they were in the brain, right? That you figured out what you couldn't say and you just didn't say it. And if you were smart, you'd find ways to not even think it. And this was as true in pro-American Western allies as it was in anti-American or pro-Soviet countries. And it was basically fueled by oil money, fueled by these national security states who were determined above anything else to keep themselves in power and to find ways to stay on their thrones, and they were quite good at it. Um, 1970s, 1980s, into the 1990s. I think one of the most famous examples of this all-pervasive system of control, um, it was one which is, I guess, apocryphal, but I, as far as I know, it's true, which is that uh, when Saddam invaded Kuwait in August of 1990, and the Saudi royal family was trying to figure out what to do. Should we invite the United States in and let them put troops on our soil? Should we decide to go along with it? You know, this was a pretty tough decision for the Saudi royal family. And so for two or three days, they just didn't allow the news to be reported. 
And so unless you happen to be one of those Saudi citizens living in a luxury hotel with access to CNN, which is a pretty small portion of the population, you simply didn't know that your next door neighbor had been invaded, controlled, and that there was a large army massed on your border. And they were able to maintain this information blockade for several days. Try and imagine that today, right? Try and imagine the idea that your next door neighbor is invaded and there's a large army on your border and nobody tweets it, right? Al Jazeera doesn't cover it. Nobody knows about it. This was as late as August of 1990. Now, the information revolution then is not just about Facebook, not just about Twitter. It's about the rise of this fundamental transformation of the nature of the flow of information and opinion. And this has been changing since the early 1990s. Uh, the other book that, uh, that, um, uh, that Ben was talking about was called Voices of the New Era Public. And it was about the rise of satellite television and Al Jazeera and the way that this affects Arab politics over the 1990s and the 2000s. Al Jazeera is the most important of these. Al Jazeera, the Qatari television station, uh, which uh, was broadcast free to view and adopted this very Arab nationalist uh, approach to reporting the news, framing everything in terms of an Arab identity, and just reveling in shattering the red lines. You know, basically anything which some government didn't want you to report on, they would report on. And everybody watched them. This became, for a certain period in Arab history, from roughly 1998 till roughly 2003, 2004, something almost unique in human history, where an entire region of the world, which was not a single nation state, was all watching the same media. And when I say all, I don't mean just like the small subset of people who are interested in the news. Like here in the United States, like we have like the, the number one uh, news network, Fox News, uh, has a rating of like 1.6 or something like that, the market share. Numbers are hard to come by in the Arab world. We don't really trust them. but. Numbers that I do trust suggest that at the peak of its popularity, the most popular program on Al Jazeera had a market share of over 50%, which made it the highest ranked show on all Arab television, including Ramadan serials, including Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and Star Academy, and like the really popular entertainment broadcasts. Everybody in the region was watching it. And what this meant was that number one, it became impossible for governments to control information about their own countries. So it used to be that if you're an Egyptian activist and you want to shout, down with Hosni Mubarak, Hosni Mubarak is evil, he shouldn't be president. OK, yeah, you could get five of your buddies and you could go stand on a street corner, hold up a sign, and say, down with Hosni Mubarak. The secret police would come and get you, round you up, torture you, maybe kill you. Um, nobody would know that it ever happened. And if anybody did happen to see you standing on the street corner, they'd probably think that it was like a film set or something, right? Because they would have no context for it. They would have no way of making any sense of it. In 2003, 2004, when the Kafaya movement in Egypt begins doing exactly the same thing, now they're able to get information about themselves out. So they would hold a protest. They would put the Al Jazeera cameraman on speed dial. And the cameraman would show up, film them before the uh, secret police could come and arrest them. And all of a sudden, 100 million Arabs would be watching this protest. There might be only 50 people in the protest, but hey, you film in close enough close up, it looks like a lot more than 50 people. And then you post all the pictures, you post the videos to your blogs, which everyone is reading. And it doesn't matter if the local newspapers don't cover you, because people who want to know can find out. And this was part of not just Egypt, but the entire region. And the key thing that I want to emphasize here is that when the Kafaya movement does this, it's not just that Jordanians or Western analysts based in Washington can see what's going on. Other Egyptians can see it as well. That's the crucial thing. No longer does it matter that uh, you're on this one neighborhood in Cairo and nobody else in Egypt knows what's going on. People in Alexandria, people on the other side of Cairo, they see it too. Now, the reason I'm going into so much depth on this is simply to say that this far predates the so-called Arab Spring, right? This is a transformation that's happening in the late 90s into the early 2000s. A lot of people think the Arab Spring came out of nowhere. 
and that you know all of a sudden this was like Eastern Europe. This is why I hate the Arab Spring concept. The notion that it came out of nowhere, like in East Germany where there was no protest and then suddenly the entire society is in the streets. That's not at all what it was like in most of the Arab world, especially Egypt. In Egypt, you had rolling protests building and spreading across Egyptian society for a decade. Over the course of that decade, it's hard to find a sector of Egyptian society that wasn't in the streets protesting. You had the Kafaya movement, which was made up of intellectuals and journalists and uh, young people and young bloggers. Um, you had lawyers, you had judges, you had teachers. The so-called April 6th movement, some of you might have heard of, refers to a major industrial action in uh, Mahala Okubra, which is kind of a gritty, grimy industrial town. And they had a big strike. You have workers out there in the streets, not just intellectuals and poets and judges and lawyers. Um, Joey Bainan uh, from Stanford University and the American University of Cairo uh, has done probably the best job of anyone to try and document this. And he argues in his database, he has over a million different uh, strikes and industrial action in, uh, and, and, and workplace uh, protests in Egypt um, in the decade before the Arab Spring. In other words, Egypt, over the course of the decade before January 25th, 2011, was a society in turmoil, in you know, rife with protest, all these different sectors of society, probably more than most other Arab countries, but still, Egypt is the, 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 the market leader here, and uh, it matters. So you have the two things going on. You have this radical change in the information environment. Starts with Al Jazeera, but then it doesn't end with Al Jazeera. Once Al Jazeera launches, everybody else suddenly can't compete anymore, right? So at one point, Jordanian TV, which used to be just god, god awful, um, you know, where you would just like have like half an hour running of the king shaking hands at the airport with the sound off. I mean, it was just unbelievable, right? Turns out that they did an internal survey in uh, late 19, it was like 1999, 2000, and they found out that their market share had plummeted to like less than 1%. I mean, literally, they were broadcasting nonsense and nobody was watching it. Well, if you're a state and you want to get your version of events out there, that's dangerous. Because if everybody's watching Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera, say, doesn't like your king, well, Al Jazeera is now going to set public expectations and beliefs about your king. So if you want to compete, you better change your own television station, make it more watchable, make it more interesting. And you did. You saw over the course of the 2000s across the region, private or state television stations becoming much more interesting and competitive, lots of satellite TV stations opening up, independent newspapers. In a place like Egypt, I mean, my god, you walk down the street and every kiosk of newspapers was filled with like a, a headlines that were critical of Hosni Mubarak, complaining about this, that, or the other, describing protests. I mean, it was unescapable for people just like walking down the street. Independent newspapers, independent or state-controlled TV stations that became more liberal and more open. And then the internet. Not because the internet comes out of nowhere, but because it layers on top of these other changes, where now you have first blogs, then Facebook, then Twitter and YouTube and all of these other ways of sharing and disseminating information. All of this means that people can share information. They become almost completely independent of states as sources of information. And states fundamentally, and in my view irrevocably, lose their ability to control or at least to shut off the flow of that information. They do get better as time goes by at manipulating that flow of information and um, kind of competing in that game. But the key thing is it's a different game. They're competing rather than dominating. Again, all of this is before uh, January 2011. Again, you're saying you came here to hear a talk about what happens after the Arab Spring, and I've just spent 15 minutes talking about things that happened before the Arab Spring. The reason for that is I really want to emphasize why I'm not ready to give in to despair about where the Arab Spring is today. Because if you think about where we are right now as kind of a blip 
in a decades-long process rather than as the collapse of a two-year-long process, you'll think about where we are very, very differently. So what is the Arab Spring? I would say, despite the fact that I hate the term and I regret ever having coined it, I actually do think that the Arab Spring was something unique. It only lasted for about two months, and it was something which was genuinely um, unusual, genuinely extraordinary. And it was a combination of things um, all happening at once. Tunisia, the original Tunisian uprising, that's something which was really unique. It was for Tunisian reasons, internal reasons. I'm happy to talk about it if people want. Um, but it really did. That, that really was one of those things where nobody could have seen that coming. Once Tunisia happened, though, once you have the uprising in Tunisia, the military doesn't intervene, and Ben Ali uh, suddenly gets on an airplane and flies away, really pissing off all the other Arab leaders who thought that he gave up far too quickly and could have just killed a few more people and saved everybody a lot of trouble. But he didn't. And as a result, you end up with suddenly, in the, the kind of the second week of January, this extraordinarily intense shared focus around the entire region on trying to interpret the implications of Tunisia. And at that time, within the Arab world, within kind of the broad Arab uh, community, basically every Arab activist, citizen, intellectual, journalist, everybody that I knew thought that their country was going to be next. And every defender of a government, and a lot of academic realists, um, said, no, there's no, no such thing as diffusion, no such thing as spillover, every case is unique. And so if you're Egypt, it's like, oh, well, we're not like Tunisia because we're big. And Saudi Arabia, we're different because we're rich. And Morocco, we're different because we have a king. Everybody had a reason that they were unique. And yet, if you were following what people were saying, the way things were being covered in the media, it was pretty clear that there was an enormous um, kind of, you know, this pressure building for something to break out somewhere. Turns out that Egypt was where it broke out on January 25th. And in Egypt, I'm not going to regale you with the entire story of the 18 days of the revolution. But again, this was extraordinary in Egypt on January 25th, not because there was protest. I just finished telling you that they'd had 10 years of protest. It was extraordinary because instead of it just being the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people who would ordinarily come out to protest, it turned into a million people. And those million people did not catch Hosni Mubarak and the security forces by surprise. They overwhelmed a fully and completely prepared security state. The entrances to Tahrir Square were blocked by ranks of security forces six deep. 10,000 people show up. They all get beaten up and hauled off to jail. A million people show up. They get overwhelmed. I think that Tunisia and the, air, and the media, this broader media environment, is what tips the balance, is what makes the difference. How does it do it? Because it sets a template, a set of expectations. People who didn't want, people who basically couldn't stand Mubarak, but didn't think that change was possible, suddenly believed that change was possible. They suddenly decided that it was worth being part of this force, of this momentum for change. They came out into the streets. It wasn't the activists that tipped the difference. It was the ordinary people who joined the activists. That linkage between the vanguard and the mass, to use a different vocabulary, was what was really different. Now, during the revolution, the, and I do think that I'm, I'm happy to call what happened in January 25th the revolution, call it an uprising if you prefer, or something else. But during those 18 days, there were a couple of key things that happened. One was when the masses came out and joined the vanguards. The second was when the military opted to not open fire. And believe me, they could have. I mean, they could have cleared Tahrir Force with tanks, helicopters, killed a few thousand people, and probably, um, you know, let's say things would have gone a bit differently. I don't know if they would have won, but it certainly would have made things a lot different. And they chose not to. Um, and once they chose not to, I think Mubarak's personal fate was sealed. The military had no love for Mubarak. The military had, the, what was the opposite of love? A lot of opposite of love for Mubarak's son, uh, Gamal. They were quite happy to see him go and to not succeed his father as president. A lot of things that are going on in those days that we can talk about. Um, but the key thing here is simply 
that over the course of those 18 days, um, you end up with this entire society coming out and Mubarak fading off into view without large-scale bloodshed. It wasn't entirely peaceful. Thousands of people died. Most of the police stations in the country were burned to the ground. It was a tough, physical uprising. But you didn't get the kind of bloodbath that you get in other places. Now, when this happens in Egypt, I would say that you get this cognitive shift that takes place around the entire region. Tunisia told people everywhere in the region that change was possible, right? When Mubarak goes on virtually the exact same script, the people rise up, occupy a central place, the military doesn't interfere, um, the president gives three speeches and then disappears, everyone has a big party, and you've had a revolution, right? Basically, Tunisia and Egypt are functionally almost exactly the same. This tells people around the region that the same thing is inevitable every place else. And that is a powerful thing. Now it's not just that change is possible, it's that change is inevitable. What links this together is that media that I was talking about, framing everything as part of a common narrative and as a common struggle. And so you, when you have Yemenis who are watching news coverage from Tunisia and saying, hey, they're just like us, appropriating the same slogans, the same posters, and responding in real time to what they're seeing on the Al Jazeera camera, it's really quite extraordinary. There was this overpowering sense of a unified narrative, the inevitability of change, and this same script playing out everywhere. You know, and it is kind of like almost tear jerking now to remember it, but at the time, activists joked about Bashar al-Assad, right? Bashar gave, gave his first speech where he basically, you know, this very uncompromising speech, and all the activists on Twitter were making fun of him, saying, oh, there's speech number one, only two more to go. Because the idea was that there was a script and it was gonna play out. It's important to note that that script did not play out in any other case, right? Everybody thought that it was gonna play out everywhere. It didn't play out any place else in that way. In Yemen, you end up with the military splitting and you end up with this kind of protracted stalemate between the, between the competing forces. In Bahrain, you get the, uh, the uh, security forces going in with Saudi and GCC assistance and clearing Pearl Roundabout, bulldozing it to the ground, unlosh, unleashing a really truly reprehensible wave of sectarian uh, repression. Um, in Saudi Arabia, they uh, manage to, uh, you know, they call for a day of rage and like one extraordinarily brave, perhaps not too bright individual shows up and disappears into the dungeons and Abdullah throws, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars out into the streets basically to buy people off. In Morocco, the young king actually makes a pretty savvy move giving a speech which makes a lot of preemptive concessions and constitutional reforms most of which didn't actually amount to much, but at the time were enough to kind of divide the opposition, deflect pressures for change. In Libya, uh, the protests are called for February 17th. And Gaddafi doesn't even wait. Like the day before, he starts killing people. Um, and, start, and again, the point is that the script doesn't play out in the same way anyplace else. The Arab Spring, I think, goes from roughly It'd be early January 2011 till mid-March of 2011, and it was defined by the unification of the Arab political space. This notion that all of the countries were linked together and that what matters, or what happens in Yemen matters for Libya. What happens in Tunisia matters for Syria. People really believed it. They were behaving as if they believed it, and you could see it playing out in real time. It was generally nonviolent. You had tight connections between elites and masses, and there was this expectation of imminent change. I would say that the Arab Spring ends, um, as spring tends to do in March, um, and it ends in a span of about 10 days when you get this count, essentially the counter revolution. Um, this is in a span of 10 days, all the bad stuff that I said before happened, right? You have Yemen turns to violence when the snipers open fire on students protesting at Sana'a University and the army splits. The Bahrain, the, uh, the, the troops roll in and clear the roundabout. 
um, you get uh, you know some pretty nasty uh, head bashing in in Amman and Jordan. Um, you know things are happening across the region all at the same time. NATO starts bombing Libya the exact same week, and the violence begins in Syria in Daraa in the exact same week. All of this happens in a span of about 10 days, and it shatters the sense of inevitability. It shatters the unification of Arab political space, and it leads us into a very different direction. So Arab Spring lasted for about two months. It was great while it happened, and um, we've been living in a post-Arab Spring. To get back to the topic of the talk, um, we've been living in the period after the Arab Spring now for uh, well over two years. What characterizes this new period? I would say that, again, I don't, we don't, I don't have time, although I'm happy to go into details in the discussion part of this, but I would say, about the details of specific countries and specific cases. But I would say, generally speaking, in the period since the Arab Spring, those crucial two months, um, in the period since then, um, we've seen countries retreating back into their, into their individual shells, into each country kind of going its own way. And you've really seen the shattering of the unity which made it so distinctive. So, the, and, and I mean that in several different ways. So number one, the unification between kind of elite activists and uh, the broader masses. Um, that kind of started, starts to peter out. The decisive, kind of the turning point is probably the constitutional referendum in Egypt in uh, March 19th of 2011 when, um, the uh, army drew up a roadmap uh, for a uh, kind of a military-led transition to democracy. The activists looked at it and said, military-led transition, it's a trap. Um, they were right. Um, but at the time, they uh, campaigned against it. They campaigned for people to either vote no or to boycott. And instead, you get like 83% approval on 80% turnout. That's pretty, a pretty shocking repudiation of the activists who thought they were going to be the leaders of the new Egypt. Turns out they weren't. And then what you end up seeing for, a lot, for the period that follows is the activists kind of at sea, flailing about, trying to find any political strategy that will work and largely failing to find one. They would go out and protest and they were not being joined by the people. The people basically were exhausted they thought with Mubarak gone, the revolution was over. And uh, you saw this disconnect grow between the, this, these kind of vanguard activists and ordinary people. You also saw really uh, increasingly troubling polarization setting in in almost every country between Islamists and non-Islamists, between Sunnis and Shia, between urban and rural. Basically, all of those divides that had been erased during that feverish moment of the Arab Spring reasserted themselves and became worse. Um, often they became worse because of the transitions themselves, right? This creates uncertainty. People are worried about their futures. If you're, if you're a non-Islamist in Egypt, yeah, you've been living with the Muslim Brotherhood for years, for decades, for you know, nearly a century. but. You were never in a position before where the Muslim Brotherhood might actually be able to write the Constitution and create the rules that you have to live by. If, you, if you're a Sunni in Bahrain, um, sure, you've always suspected that your Shia neighbors were actual Iranian fifth columnists. But hey, you had a Sunni king. You didn't need to worry about it because you had a Sunni king to protect you. Suddenly, you're not so sure about that anymore. So part of it is uncertainty. Part of it is conscious manipulation uh, strategies, and here's where the, the, the Blogs and Bullets project that I'm involved with um, has really been uh, quite depressingly illuminating as we've been able to track this. And part of it, you don't need any specialized information. You just have to watch TV and watch you know, the, the kind of official rhetoric that's out there in the Arab media. There's just been profound um, kind of uh, uh, sectarian and uh, political polarization, mobilization going on in the media, just unbelievable levels of propaganda, scare campaigns, demonization. Uh, I think that social media contributes to this because it turns out that in the Arab world, one of the iron laws of online kind of social media environments in general is really vividly uh, on display. And that's uh, the tendency of people in social media environments to self-select into uh, bubbles, informational bubbles, where basically you, you, you Associate with people just like you, 
and then you become more and more distant from and hostile to people who are not like you. And we see this in the case of Syria. We have a big paper coming out in, in a week or two, uh, hopefully. I, I shouldn't make any promises. I don't know when it's coming out. Hopefully it'll come out soon, um, where we can actually track um, and statistically um, these processes happening, where we can actually show um, what in early 2011, where you have basically everybody is linking to everybody else and sharing very similar kinds of information. By early 2012, there's these clusters of extremely insular and intensely polarized bubbles that interact with each other hardly at all. And so we don't have to guess about this anymore. We can actually show it. And the effect of this is to basically to consolidate and to drive sectarianism and polarization. And almost every country that you look at right now, you can see how this is playing out from Tunisia to Egypt uh, and beyond. If you look at the big, kind of the big countries right now and where we are in the region, and I'm just going to wrap up with this and then say a few words about US foreign policy um, and what this I mean, what this all means for the US, I would say that you know, if, if the big meta message is don't despair because the big structural changes are in the direction of change, the, um, the uh, slightly less meta message is going to be a bit less reassuring because change doesn't mean change for the better. And I think that's been pretty clear. Uh, I'm quite confident that the old order is unsustainable. There's no return to the old status quo. It always just, I, I think it's a little out of order here, but I'll just say it now. The argument that somehow the United States lost Egypt because it didn't uh, back Hosni Mubarak just strikes me as so hopelessly out of touch with what was happening in Egypt. At the time when Americans were worried about whether or not we should back or back Mubarak or push for him to, uh, pu push for him to go, there were, mil there were a million people in the streets. Every police station in Alexandria and most of Upper Egypt had been burned to the ground. And trust me, nobody was waiting to see what Barack Obama was going to say about whether Mubarak should stay or go. That's not the issue, right? And the forces that drove Mubarak out remain. And that's why when I look at a place like Egypt, I think that what drove Hosni Mubarak from power is in many ways the same thing which ultimately drove Mohamed al-Morsi from power and is likely a year from now to drive uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi from power. The fundamental failures of the Egyptian state, the absence of any political consensus, grinding unemployment, empty and hollow state institutions, crumbling infrastructure, and, um, and the inability of any leadership to do anything about that, combined with the mobilizing power of a mobilized population. I wouldn't be, uh, th this is not the time for you to be buying uh, I, I wouldn't be, uh, what, what, what is it called when you, uh, is it buy low or whatever? This isn't the time to invest in Egypt. And there's a reason why nobody is, because there's not going to be a return to stability there. I'm very pessimistic about, about Egypt. I think that uh, the military coup in Egypt essentially broke Egyptian politics. And uh, it's not going to be fixed for quite some time. Um, I think that when you have a military coup like that, it, there's no easy going back. It's going to take time. And so what we're going to get over the next year, you can you know, write this down. I mean, this is what's going to happen. I guarantee it. Um, you're going to see some kind of return to democracy, a roadmap to democracy. There'll be a constitution passed. There'll be elections. Everyone will pretend that they matter, but they won't because they're not going to restore any kind of political consensus. They're not going to fix the underlying problems that Egypt faces. So there's going to be a democratic charade in Egypt for a while, but it's not going to be anything real. I think that instead, Egypt is going to have ongoing perpetual turbulence. And, and I think that that's what we're going to see across much of the region. So Egypt is depressing. Egypt is bad. But Syria is the worst. Because Syria, <laughs> just to you know, make you even more cheerful, um, so basically, North Africa as a whole, I'm not as bullish on North Africa as I was a year ago. It's hard for anyone to be optimistic about anything in the Middle East right now. But I still think that when you take the broader five to 10 year window, I still think that North Africa is, most of the countries of North Africa are going to pull themselves together and do all right, even Egypt. It's going to take longer in Egypt than it would have if they had stuck it to a democratic transition path. But I still think that most of the countries of North Africa are going to pull themselves together. And I think the countries of the Gulf, including Saudi Arabia, are likely to be facing a 
much more intense and severe uh, bout of turbulence and popular mobilization in the next uh, uh, two to five years. I think that Saudi Arabia in particular is far less stable than people think it is and um, that all the conditions are there for major mobilization um, which in the, if, that, if it comes in the context of leadership succession, remember the king is old, quite unwell and uh, by all accounts is barely working more than an hour a day and the youthful successors are even older than he is. Um, you know, there, uh, Saudi Arabia has a lot of problems and I think that if you look across the Gulf, they're actually primed for a wave of turbulence and I expect they're going to get it. But because they're rich and um, have strong international support, I think they'll be able to handle it in various ways. But on the Levant, I, I'm positively apocalyptic in terms of where the Levant is going. Um, because Syria is not, I th in, my, in my judgment, is not going to be resolved uh, anytime soon. Regardless of whether Assad falls, regardless of whether we manage to cobble together some kind of political transition agreement in Geneva, um, regardless of whether the United States had decided to intervene and bomb and invade and occupy the place, doesn't matter. The Syrian state has been fundamentally broken and is thoroughly penetrated in a regional proxy war at this point. And the forces that have been unleashed of sectarian polarization, uh, the, the jihadist movement, which has become increasingly entrenched and, and almost, as near as I can tell, erased the border between Syria and Iraq um, with the kind of the interrelated insurgencies um, across that border um, between Syria and Iraq. I think this is going to be a civil war which is going to continue in various uh, degrees of horror uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to put it back together. I mean, it's been bad already with you know, millions of refugees, something like a, a third of the population now displaced, um, just unbelievably horrific humanitarian consequences. And yet there's no sense whatsoever on either side of the kind of mutual exhaustion or readiness to negotiate, which might lead you to believe that any kind of end of the war is possible. Um, and so I think that this is going to continue. And I think that what we actually see in Syria now is the entrenchment of local power in such a way that, they're going to con that you're going to see a highly decentralized and fragmented Syria, um, even if you get some kind of political transition in Damascus. We've seen cases like this before and they rarely de-escalate easily. Um, and so I'm, I'm extremely pessimistic about Syria. And as with my point about, uh, about Egypt before, all the American debates about whether we should have been arming the rebels or that sort of thing have always struck me as just a complete red herring. Um, the US arming the rebels will make virtually no difference whatsoever. Um, US military airstrikes would have made virtually no difference. Um, because of where the war is. There was a moment when this was an important debate and that moment was in the first half of 2012 when a strategic, a strategic decision was being taken um, as to whether to continue a peaceful, up, a largely peaceful uprising in the face of a brutal authoritarian regime killing uh, innocent civilians or to shift to an armed insurgency against that brutal uh, totalitarian regime. Once the choice for an insurgency was made, and that decision was made on the ground in Syria, it was made in Riyadh, it was made in Turkey, um, the die was cast. And I think that much of what, most of what has happened since has lar was largely preordained once the decision was made to go to an insurgency where neither side could hope to win um, and yet neither side could deliver or agree to any kind of a political resolution. The United States being involved would have just had us involved in an increasingly intractable quagmire, but wouldn't have been enough to solve it. And that is a depressing uh, reality, but I do think it's the reality. Um, and so basically, it's hard to offer anything positive to say about Syria, unless you want to talk about the way in which Syria is spreading its sectarian poison around the entire region and destabilizing all of the neighbors. Um, 
Jordan has been far more resilient than most people expect it, and I think I actually expect it will continue to be so. Jordan is quite experienced and good, unfortunately, at I mean, not unfortunately for Jordan, but I mean, unfortunately for its own history, Jordan is quite good at absorbing waves of refugees, quite experienced at it, and it's likely to survive. Lebanon, not so good, but um, has, to this point at least, um, been able to handle the influx of refugees, which by some measures now takes up to 30 to 40 percent of its entire population. The, the Zathari refugee camp in Jordan is now the third largest city in Jordan. It's not going anywhere. Even if the war ends, the Zathari is not going anywhere, and we all know it. Turkey will probably be okay, simply because it's so big and it's been able to keep its refugees living miserably along its border rather than destabilizing its center. Um, and uh, um, what is not going to be okay is Iraq, where, as I said, the, Sun the, the jihadist insurgency in, um, in uh, Syria is essentially the same insurgency as the one in Iraq. They're increasingly interdependent. The pace of attacks, the scale of violence, and the kind of control at the local level that these uh, organizations have in both the Syrian parts and the Iraqi parts is one of the most profoundly disturbing and yet the least discussed um, parts of the uh, spillover of, of the Syrian war. Um, Jordan gets a lot more attention than uh, Iraq, but Iraq is far more um, is far more worrisome in many ways. So that's fairly apocalyptic. Um, I think that it is unlikely to end anytime soon. Um, what haven't I talked about? Well, you know, the little things. You know, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process going nowhere. U.S.-Iran nuclear talks. You got me. Um, we can talk about it if you want to. Um, but um, those are only tangentially related to the Arab Spring, which I was asked to talk about. So um, why don't I just stop there because I've hit my 45-minute mark, and I'm sure you all have lots of things you'd like to talk about. So go ahead and ask me anything, um, and I'll try and elaborate, expand, or backtrack, as the case may be. If you could pass, um, when you raise your hand to ask a question, please try to use your loudest indoor voice. We're recording, and we don't have a microphone to hand around. And uh, Mark, if uh, someone doesn't have a very loud indoor voice, maybe uh, you can repeat the question. We can use your playground voice. <laughs> Okay, so I know it's, um, a lot of the other Middle Eastern countries, a lot of the leaders like Erdogan are blaming foreign influences as starting um, a lot of the protest and reforms in the nation. Do you think that foreign influences played a role in Egypt in any way, or was it just strictly an internal uprising? I think it was 99% internal uh, in Egypt and in most places. But I mean, we live in a globalized world, right? And so people can draw inspiration and lessons from elsewhere. So, so it is true, for example, that a number of important Egyptian activists went off to Serbia and got training from Serbian activists. And it's true. But so what? Who cares? Because those you know, seven guys who went and did an NDI training in Serbia um, had very little to do with the sudden eruption of millions of people coming out into the streets. And so I think that generally the discourse of of you know, kind of foreign causes is, um, or, or, or foreign instigators is more of like a regime survival strategy than anything else. Trying to delegitimize uh, internal protest as part of a foreign conspiracy, I think it's just part of the toolkit of how you how you deal how you approach this. But the other the other flip side of it is one of the really depressing things is when you get these kinds of self fulfilling prophecies. Because back when Bashar al Assad started talking about the Syrian protests and talking about them as you know, kind of jihadists who were supported by Saudi Arabia to destabilize an Iranian ally. It was laughable when he was saying this stuff in the summer of 2011, and it was manifestly untrue. But now, two and a half years later, here we are, where you can actually shape and create precisely the kind of absurdities which um, were previously untrue, and those self-fulfilling prophecies such as you know, Bahraini Shia uh, being Iranian fifth columnist. Absolutely untrue. Um, the, the people who were driving the protests in Bahrain um, were not all Shia. And uh, the ones that I'm most familiar with 
were veteran human rights activists, uh, civil society activists, democracy activists. They had reformist ambitions, and they ostentatiously uh, uh, rejected any idea that they were uh, that they were Iranian pawns. They were painted as such by a regime that was trying to delegitimate them. And over time, uh, many Bahraini Sunnis came to believe it. And Saudis uh, really believe it. Um, they're, they're absolutely convinced that it's the truth. And um, if I were a Bahraini Shia at a certain point where I'm being you know, tortured and beaten and repressed for being an Iranian pawn, which I'm not, at what point do I say, OK, why well, don't let's go ahead and take the money, right? At what point does this become a self-fulfilling prophecy? And I think that um, that's one of the reasons why that kind of rhetoric can be so highly damaging, in, especially in sectar divided sectarian countries uh, like Bahrain. Um, mm -hmm. What chance is there that the instability in Egypt will lead to militarization in the Sinai Peninsula and then evoke a response from Israel? Well, on the first part, um, I'd say 100%. And it's already happened. I mean, I think there's already more or less an insurgency uh, and complete state breakdown and militarized uh, conditions in the Sinai. It's uh, state authority basically doesn't exist there anymore, and the level of violence is extremely high. Um, what that leads to action by Israel, though, I think unlikely. I think more likely you'll see increased increased cooperation and coordination between uh, the Egyptian government and the Israeli government. Um, maybe you know, kind of verbal uh, uh, amendments of the, of the agreements over the deployment of Egyptian forces, um, and I think that's more likely than any kind of direct uh, Israeli uh, intervention. I think the Israelis are quite happy with the uh, extent to which uh, the current Egyptian government is, for example, controlling the Gaza tunnels or basically completely, completely shutting them down, um, and. Uh, I don't know, Dan would know better than I would, but I think they're pretty happy with um, the, the kind of the way that the current Egyptian government is trying to crack down um, in the Sinai. But I, I, it's certainly an area of concern. Um, Dan? I don't want to address that. <laughs> but I did want to ask you uh, a question or, or uh, first of all, great talk. Uh, always delighted to hear someone who's at least as gloomy as I am. Um, but you tell a story that um, it seems to me the front half is very much focused on almost technological drivers, technological determinism of the opening, and that's all very interesting. But then um, you sort of, in the latter part, kind of just say, but it's incomplete. And, and I share your long, very long-term hopefulness. You know, Joe and Lai still waiting to hear how the French Revolution turned out. But, um, <laughs> and I feel the same way about the Arab Spring. But it seems to me that if we're talking out with, starting out with uh, technological determinism on the front end, there's reaction capital in the state on the back end. And it seems to me that it's one could tell a different story and that it's really about uh, a democratic awakening being, in a sense, swamped uh, by the sectarian and rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the Gulfies afterwards. Syria, both sides are all in. It's existential for Iran and for the Saudis, the Qataris, the UAE, uh, they've got to have payback for losing Iraq. And these are the key drivers, it seems to me, right now. And the amount of mobilization that's going on is extraordinary. And what's more is you can even see uh, a, uh, a side effect in Egypt, because I don't think the military would have acted the way it did without a promise of billions and billions from the Gulf. So. It's a little bit of, you know, if you can use an analogy, it's Europe after Napoleon. They're saying, we're not going to let these people get out of control here. And they do have real, a real rivalry going and real hatred. And they're particularly stoked up by the nuclear issue, but also by Iranian, you know, revisionism. So anyway, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, that sort of story. I, I, I completely agree with you on Syria. I mean, it, it's what began as a genuine kind of civil uprising um, has almost become virtually completely a, uh, a proxy war and uh, with devastating revol results. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you at all about Syria. Um, on the, the, the rest of the region, I also agree with you about the, about the Saudi role and the Gulf role, this kind of counter-revolutionary role. Um, in, in the book, I have the, the title, the, the chapter title is uh, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, you know, the chapter four is like Star Wars, like the New Hope, you know, the the protesters come in and blow up the Death Star, then Empire Strikes Back is kind of gloomier. Um, but 
The, but, but basically, the idea is that the Saudis and uh, the Emiratis and the GCC, well, I, I won't go so far as to say the GCC, because of course the GCC is divided between this fierce battle between the Qataris and the uh, Saudis, which the Saudis won when uh, the Qatari Emir decided that he didn't want to be Emir anymore. Um, for reasons that nobody nobody seems willing to agree with me that this was a defeat for Qatari foreign policy. And uh, everyone wants to tell me that uh, this is just because the Emir wanted to go out and live on the Riviera. And I just don't believe it. I mean, I think that I, I just. I, they have a strange history, Mr. Chairman. Yes, they do in Qatar. And I, I just don't believe it. I mean, I think that uh, Hamid bin Jassim and the Qataris um, basically were overexposed in this battle and they lost. And I think that, but anyway, that's a side issue. The, the real issue is that uh, the, the Saudis and the Emiratis have clearly had a concerted strategy to try and roll back the Arab uprisings and to rebuild state control. And uh, they began at home, as I described, in, in Saudi Arabia and in Bahrain. Um, the Saudis were spreading money around uh, throughout the entire early Arab Spring to the, Jordan the Jordanians, the Morocco, the Moroccans. Um, and, uh, and to the poorer uh, Gulf states uh, like Oman. Um, and then uh, I don't think that it was just the promise of billions of dollars. I mean, I think the GCC immediately stepped forward with uh, like $12 billion in uh, direct deposit to the central bank to, to pay off the coup and explicitly to counter, to, counter, uh, to offset any uh, reduction in US aid, which might, uh, which might happen. Um, and so, yeah, no, absolutely. There's no question about it. And um, so I think that the idea that uh, the conservative uh, GCC, conservative goal states, would lead a counteroffensive against these transformations, I think is not actually a counter to the argument I'm making. I mean, I think that basically what they're seeing is a structural trend which is unfavorable to them. And they're then deploying the resources at their disposal, largely money and sectarianism. Um, as a way to try and blunt those forces of change. The question is whether that will be enough to succeed and whether they can actually do it. And I think that there the verdict is out. I would say that technological determinism isn't exactly how I would describe my argument because I do think that the, the technology and the structural change I think is a real structural change which has a whole set of systemic effects. But what happens within that new environment is not, de is not determinist. So I would say that, so for example, the Bahrainis pioneered very effectively um, the way to basically destroy an online public sphere by flooding Twitter, Facebook, and the major social media sites with pro-regime accounts and uh, highly, like, it used to be that back in like the hottest days of Bahrain, if I tweeted something about Bahrain, I would immediately get blasted with 150, 200, 250 um, hostile um, at responses on my Twitter feed um, from a pro-regime perspective. A number of like the major like curator hubs, I won't say their names, but you can probably guess who they are because there aren't that many of us, um, basically admitted that they stopped tweeting about Bahrain because they couldn't handle the abuse that they were getting. It was overwhelming everything else that they were trying to do, and it just wasn't worth it. And um, that was a good lesson for a lot of, or a bad lesson, I suppose, um, for a lot of other Arab governments about how to uh, deal with, with this. There's, uh, there's various kinds of censorship, surveillance, technological controls, um, people, uh, regimes mining Facebook accounts uh, for potential subversive activity and arresting people based on it. I mean, a whole set of things that went on there. Um, I would say that in some ways, the most depressing thing that I've seen in Egypt was not even the coup, not even the, um, the bloody clearing of the square, as horrible as those things were, but rather the way that uh, kind of the, the Egyptian public seems to have gone collectively insane um, in their embrace of the coup. And uh, just their embrace of crazy conspiracy theories. I mean, the, so I don't know how many of you are on the, on the receiving end of any of this, but uh, the day after the coup, I and I think every other analyst in Washington got something like a thousand emails, all strikingly similar, um, explaining how this was not a coup, but it was actually the continuation of a popular revolution, and just these fierce battles over the definition of it. But you know, it's, 
it's really, since a big part of my argument is that uh, with this new information environment, people are no longer going to be able to be manipulated and controlled by governments, I would say that the, uh, the collective insanity of the Egyptian public is actually kind of a, a, a negative finding on that, their embrace of, of these things. And, you know, extremely smart, well-educated uh, Egyptians who are friends of mine, friends of ours, seem to truly believe that the American ambassador in Cairo was personally directing sniper squads um, to kill Egyptian soldiers on behalf of a plot to impose Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, control over Egypt. They seem to really believe this. And that is kind of a blow against my notion of this collective, you know, kind of emancipation, emancipatory power of, um, of information technology. Nevertheless, I'd like to believe that uh, their fever will break and they'll come back to their senses. Um, but I guess that, kind of, that does kind of remain to be seen. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the question I uh, asked behind me about uh, Israel on the Sinai Peninsula, do you think the Arab Spring and the uh, resulting do you think the Arab Spring and the resulting uh, instability in a lot of these countries has uh, increased Israel security or has it decreased? Is Israel safer? For the I don't. I don't. I don't think Israelis feel safer. I mean, I think Israelis feel and justifiably like uh, a region that was largely stable and largely uh, you know, protecting their security and interests has come crumbling down around them. Um, I mean, I think that to most of the Israeli uh, officials and just Israelis that I talk to um, are just profoundly worried about, about the spillover from Syria, about uh, Egypt, although they, they tend to be much happier about the, uh, the, the current government than the Muslim Brotherhood government. Um, the, they're terrified that Jordan will be destabilized, terrified that Lebanon will be destabilized. So, I mean, I, I, you could probably make a case that objectively Israel is more secure simply because a region that is consumed by their own internal problems is not likely to you know, start, a, start a war against Israel. But I don't think very many Israelis that I talk to feel uh, safer or more secure. Um, I guess that's the, the, the short version of it. I also think that, that feeling of insecurity and feeling of like everything collapsing around them most likely leads them to be less willing to make the kind of you know difficult in their view dangerous compromises that would be necessary for a peace agreement with Palestinians because from their point of view that just adds that much more insecurity and instability at a time when everything else is in flux and falling apart so the overall, you know, the, the sense that I get from the Israeli political class is one of, look, we've got these walls. We're going to hunker down behind them and wait for this to pass. And at exactly the time when you have, uh, you know, the John Kerry out there trying to push towards uh, 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 an agreement for, towards a two-state solution, which is an admirable thing for him to be doing, but I don't get a lot of sense from Israelis right now that they're kind of in the mental, ontological place where they want to make these you know, kind of big, risky decisions. Another depressing topic you said you were speaking about was U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Where should, where should we go? What should we do? It depends on what you want to achieve uh, with U.S. foreign policy. I mean, I, I tend to be of the opinion that, um, that the U.S. needs to uh, reduce its footprint in the region and that it is not going to be able to do as much and it shouldn't try. Um, and I mean, I've, this is what I've been saying for quite some time. Like getting out of Iraq was the right thing to do. Staying out of Syria has been the right thing to do. And part of it is just the simple overextension and exhaustion of all those wars and everything. But part of it is also the Arab uprisings themselves. To the extent that you have these mobilized populations reacting against uh, a status quo, which is an American-backed and American-created status quo, it's, it's inevitably going to be more difficult for the U.S. to get what it wants. Now, I've also been a big advocate of kind of sustained, deep engagement with this new Arab public. Um, but right now, like what I was just saying about Egypt, there aren't a lot of people who seem to be particularly interested in engaging with us. Um, and so I think that really this is going to have to be a time of, as you saw with the president's uh, speech in, at the U.N. Uh, a couple weeks ago, focusing on big strategic issues, um, you know, trying to find some resolution on the Iranian nuclear program, pushing for Israeli-Palestinian peace, I guess. Um, 
I mean, again, it's, it's the right thing to do, but I just don't see much chance that there's going to be any progress there. Whereas on Iran, I think there's a real chance to make progress. So I think that's the right thing to be doing. Um, Counterterrorism. But even like, I've been a huge supporter of democracy promotion for many, many years. But right now, there's just the very little the US can actually do to positively influence uh, you know, the spread of democracy or consolidation of democracy uh, around the region. And so I guess where what I think is the right thing to do is much more of a lower footprint, uh, less active involvement, and really kind of convincing the whole region, which really doesn't quite believe this, um, that uh, that's what we're actually doing. I think the Syria debate has been extremely instructive, for better or for worse. Um, I think that um, I, I was describing this to a few other people before before this began, but you know I think that if you go back to like the spring of 2012, pretty much everybody in the region and everybody in Washington assumed that we were going to intervene in Syria eventually. That Obama might resist for a while, but he'd be dragged into it because that's what the United States does. And the fact that he has not allowed himself to be drawn into Syria is actually almost revolutionary in, in its own way. And I think that people in the region are only now beginning to internalize that. I think that's part of the story behind the Saudi temper tantrum, part of the, part of the reason that you're seeing so much unease. What this leads people to do and to think about the United States over the longer term, we really don't know. That's why I think that we should be, with, we, we should be reducing our active direct intervention while increasing our engagement and our attempt to explain what we're doing and to engage with a broader set of the public. But, um, but I think that the reality is that even if we wanted a more interventionist foreign policy, there's just no support for it. I mean, we can't even keep our government open. I mean, how, how are we supposed to pay for a war in Syria when we can't even pay, you know, we can't even pay the you know, senior Pentagon officials and we're furloughing them? I always wondered how that would have been if the government shutdown had taken place at a time when we were, you know, 60 days into a bombing campaign, escalating bombing campaign in Syria, um, and then the government shut down. I mean, I suppose that the military personnel would have been essential, I suppose, but um, it really would have been quite an interesting set of optics. Um, so I think it's not, I think it's quite interesting that before that big debate broke out about, in, about intervening in Syria in August, public opinion polls typically showed about 70% uh, opposition to uh, US intervention. By the time the debate was done and the, gover and the administration had done its hard sell on, uh, on, on why we needed to do it, um, at least in some polls, it was now 80% opposed. Because basically, people don't want to do it. And I think that in a democracy, it's extremely difficult to maintain kind of an interventionist policy when you don't have public support for it, or at least it should be. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned the Saudi temper tantrum. And over the past year, relations between the US and Saudi Arabia have gotten a lot worse because we don't like what they did with Egypt, they don't like what we did with Syria, and now we're the world's largest oil producer, so we've become, in a sense, less strategically dependent on them. My question is, do you think this is more of a long-term trend, or will we restore relations with Saudi Arabia eventually? Well, we don't need to restore relations with Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's still a, a strong and robust alliance, but they're upset because we're not doing what they want to do. Uh, we're not doing what they want us to do. Um, they wanted us to do something in Syria, and we didn't want to do it. I think we were right to not want to do it, but they're upset that we didn't do it. They're extremely worried about the idea that we might actually resolve the Iranian nuclear uh, 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 problem. Because for them, the nuclear uh, weapons aren't really the issue. It's more of this broad geopolitical competition that, that Ambassador Benjamin was talking about. Um, that I think they're very worried that we're going to cut a deal with Iran at their expense. Um, they were horrified by the notion that we actually meant what we said about democracy. And they don't want to hear any more about that. Um, I mean, no, but seriously, I mean, the, the Saudis are extreme. I, I think that much of the leadership of the Gulf and, and, and in Israel also, was kind of hardwired to the kind of policy that the Bush administration had. Not the invasion of Iraq. I think everyone was kind of uh, uncertain about that or opposed to it. But I think the general notion of organizing the region around an alliance of so-called moderates against Iran and its proxies was quite sympathetic, quite compatible to most of the leaders of the Gulf and in Israel. And that was 
And so they find it now very destabilizing and, uh, and mystifying that we don't seem to want to do that. And they can't quite make sense of it, creates uncertainty, creates the kinds of tensions that you're seeing. Um, but at the same time, they have no place else to go. And I think that after the tantrum, um, which was, keep in mind, was by uh, Bandar bin Sultan, not by the Saudis, but done by one faction of the Saudi royal family, which has always been, you know, Bandar has always been more interventionist and, and more hawkish on these things. Um, and so, you know, a very public tantrum directed to journalists so that we got the message. Um, so after the tantrum, you get the walk back where they realize, you know what, they actually, I mean, where are they going to go, Russia? You know, Russia has nothing to offer them politically, militarily, economically, culturally. China, China wants nothing to do with uh, security providing role in the Gulf. They should. I don't understand why there isn't a Chinese naval presence in the Gulf. Um, it seems like there should be one, um, given what they are. But uh, basically, I think that uh, Professor Wolferth is right. We're still in a unipolar situation, and they have no place else to go. And I think they're realizing that. So they're going to complain. They're going to be uncertain. Get some of that. What, what did you call? Or, uh, what did they used to call it? The leash leash slipping. Uh, uh, there, there's some leash slipping, and they'll mouth off and do some things we don't like. But fundamentally, the structure as it is now, they have no place else to go. Um, and so, in a sense, I think that you know for the, what the U.S. needs to do with Saudi Arabia is basically to you know give them a big old warm hug and tell them how much we love them but not change a single thing that we're doing and basically have them accommodate to our preferences rather than us accommodating their preferences. I mean, that's basically how I would, what I would recommend there. Um, is it going to be a really good relationship? Um, well, I mean, depends what you mean by good, right? I mean, it's a strategic relationship based on our protecting the flow of oil, but I mean, come on, this is a country where Right now, there's the, this mobilized Arab public in Saudi Arabia means women bravely fighting for the right to drive. I mean, come on, this is one of the most uh, human rights abusing, uh, 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 gender abusing, um, you know, kind of, th this is not a good society from an American values point of view. And I think that's one of the real problems there is that the only thing which keeps this alliance together is the strategic. And if the strategic changes, well, there's nothing else to hold it together. And I think that there's some recognition of that. Mm -hmm. um, so we've heard from the past two years, or what you would define as perhaps the post-Arab Spring world, a lot about this growing sort of polarization between Shiites and Sudi in terms of sectarian lines. So you have Hezbollah fighting feather, fe fellow Arabs in Syria. You have this sort of Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia interplay between Shia and Sunni. <coughs> so what is the role of this greater sort of sectarian conflict that we're starting to see between Sunnis on one side and Shia on the other in terms of terrorist groups on both sides as well as like legitimate state actors on both sides? Well? The really sad thing is that um, I don't think that this sectarianism was anything which is necessary, hardwired. This is not like the reemergence re of ancient hatreds, the sort of thing that you hear. I think that a lot of the sectarianism that you see now is actively constructed by regimes as part of their survival strategy, specifically the Saudis. Um, and I think it's done um, in order to, you know, it's manipulated as a way to, uh, win, this, to win the support of your, of your Sunni citizens and to uh, delegitimize the political demands of your Shia citizens. It was inflamed by Iraq in the 2000s. I mean, the images on Al Jazeera and on YouTube and just the reality of sectarian bloodbaths and cleansing, as they call it, but basically meaning the mass displacement, murder and rape of people on the basis of a sectarian identity, doesn't go away quickly. And I think that generated some real, that it really took hold there. Same thing in Syria, where the reality of people being butchered uh, for their sectarian identity forces people in that direction. And so I guess the point that, I, that I'm trying to make is that this wasn't like the revealing of pre-existing sectarian hatreds. It was the constructing of those sectarian hatreds through state strategies and the realities of civil war. And of course, civil wars that are being played out in this unified uh, media landscape. So everyone is exposed to it. I mean, you go to Tunisia, you go to Egypt, and people are watching. They'll show you the videos 
Uh, they'll show you, you know, they'll pull out their phones and show you the YouTube videos of sectarian atrocities. I mean, I found out about the execution of Saddam in Cairo. Uh, I was in Cairo at the time, and people were pulling out their cell phones and showing me YouTube videos uh, the, uh, you know, the Muqtada, Muqtada assassination. And, um, you know, so people feel it, and they feel it, and then it, be, then it becomes entrenched in their own identities. And so it becomes something real, even though it previously wasn't real. But at a certain point, it's very hard to go back. You know, it's much easier to ratchet these things up than it is to ratchet them down. And, you know, I, you know, so remember all this talk about, um, about uh, in Iraq back in the late 2000s, all this talk about reconciliation, and we need to find ways to get Sunni Shia reconciliation. I always thought it was ridiculous. Um, you could push for accommodation. In other words, some kind of governmental structure which would accommodate the basic interests of the Sunni community, but that's not going to be reconciliation. You know, when your family has been butchered and driven into exile on the basis of your religious identity, you're not going to forget or forgive that. It, it doesn't work that way. I think that Iraq is going to be divided by sectarian hatred and animosity for, gener for a generation, and so is Syria. And if Egypt continues on its current trajectory, um, so is Egypt. Not between Sunni and Shia, but between Islamist and non-Islamist, Christian and Muslim. I mean, that's the direction that they're going. Because it's one thing to say that these are artificial identities, they're constructed. But I don't think that you can deconstruct as easily as you can construct. And that's why this is so troubling, what's happening right now. Because you might not be able to get back, climb back down. Mm -hmm. Given the recent developments in U.S.-Iran relations, do you think that Saudi Arabia, you know, could succeed in amassing uh, large-scale support uh, using sectarianism, even among, you know, Sunnis that were ambivalent or even critical of the Saudi regime, that it could, you know, come out in the future, you, you know, you spoke of the future turbulence, it could come out in the future using the sectarianism to avoid turbulence and maybe even gain a bigger sphere of influence? I think it has diminishing returns. I mean, sectarianism is useful for some things and not useful for others. So you can get everyone together united by their uh, mistrust of Iran and the Shia, but that doesn't resolve your internal conflicts between uh, you know, tribal differences or between uh, uh, you know, Salafis versus uh, Muslim brothers versus secularists. In other words, you're still going to have all these divisions and competitions within the Sunni world. Um, and in some ways, it almost makes it even more intense. Once you've defined it as, the, as like the Sunni world, well, okay, that then raises the stakes for the different people who might plausibly compete for the leadership of that world. Same thing that you saw in Pan-Arabism back in the 1950s. If you read, like, you know, so Nasser wants to be the leader, but the Ba'athists and lots of others want to be the leaders. And so they're fighting for that same, that same uh, political space. Um, the Saudis have some advantages, and they have some disadvantages in all of this. Um, mostly their advantages are their money and uh, their control of, of the Hajj and, uh, and the holy sites. Um, but uh, the Qataris have money too. The Emiratis have money too. And um, all of them are viewed with suspicion outside of the Gulf. And so, you know, if you look at what happened with Qatar in uh, the last, say, five years, what you get is a rapid diplomatic ascent followed by an absolute crash of their diplomacy. I actually think the Saudis are probably on the same trajectory. Right now, I, in fact, I think right now they're probably getting close to their peak. And you can only you know, shovel money into the furnace of the Egyptian Central Bank for so long before people start asking, what are we getting out of this? And then once you start trying to get things out of it, you then start generating um, uh, backlash in the, in the local society. You know, the Egyptians were very happy to get Qatari money at first. And then they started to feel that, hey, the Qataris are trying to impose the Muslim Brotherhood on us. And uh, Egyptians turned against them. And uh, if, if Egyptians turn against uh, General Sisi, they're going to turn against the Saudis and the Emiratis too and say, well, you put us in this situation. And so again, I, don't, I wouldn't straight line it. I, I see this much more as kind of an up and down kind of situation. One of the unique factors there is that so much of the laboring class in the Gulf countries uh, and the folks who, in theory, have the biggest set of economic grievances are foreigners. And that's especially true in places like Qatar and Abu Dhabi, but to a lesser, but still a significant extent in Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. Do you think 
they will ever be a source of revolutionary potential, or is their political and social position so tenuous that it'll never happen? I think it's extraordinarily difficult for the migrant workers to organize or to act uh, politically in, in these societies. They really are extraordinarily tightly controlled through a complex interlocking web of, of, uh, of contracts and security forces, and they can be expelled at a moment's notice. They have no political rights or, for that matter, human rights whatsoever. Um, and so I, I don't see any possibility, really, that they could act in any kind of effective political way. On the other hand, if you're in a place like, uh, you know, if you're in a place where you're basically, your citizens are swimming in a sea of, of unhappy, uh, aggrieved laborers, uh, there's always going to be, you know, potential for kind of anomic violence, um, that sort of thing. But to this point, I, I haven't really seen much indication of that. I mean, working in the Gulf is, for the most part, a real economic opportunity for the people who are coming there. They're coming there because they want to make money and send it back home. And most don't want to put that at risk no matter how badly they're treated. And there's an extraordinary, you know, again, this extremely tight web of control, uh, security and legal and everything else to stop them. So first sign of, of undesirable political activity, off you go. And that sends a message to everybody else. But um, there is something about a society where you have like you know, 80, 90% of the people living in the country are non-citizens with no rights. It doesn't really seem either desirable or sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a different question, because you're talking about how technology played a crucial role in the <coughs> starting of this whole thing. But I guess I kind of feel like there's a lot of countries out there that have oppressive regimes that use censorship to kind of control information. And we didn't see this kind of thing happen. So I was wondering if you could kind of explain, like having spent so much time in the region, the cultural or just whatever reasons in the region that like made this happen here and nowhere else. I think that that's why I was really trying to emphasize the layering effect. That it's not just the, the presence of the technology and the media, uh, the, of the social media itself. It's that layered on top of the, of the, of the satellite television and this unified Arab identity and everything else. And so, I mean, I think that the timing of this is just really important that you get this, this extremely fast, um, condensed, and utterly unexpected uprising in Tunisia, followed by the identical one in Egypt, all taking place in this highly unified transnational Arab public space, which really makes it play out very, very differently. Uh, you don't have that anyplace else. Um, I mean, you don't have the, the same language, you don't have that same sense of shared identity, and you don't have that particular combination of kind of authoritarianism along with this kind of active, subversive public sphere. So I think, you know, just politically, uh, the technology plays out differently. Not so much culturally, I would say, as the way you get these unifying identities and uh, transnational flows, which really makes it quite different. But it's also vulnerable. Right, because once that sense of uh, inevitability breaks down, once that sense of unity breaks down, it's very clear that the technology alone is not enough uh, to sustain ongoing protest. And it's very clear that the activists that were empowered by, those, uh, by the social media were extremely bad at translating that into political parties, into political institutions, into anything other than protest. I mean, there was a, there was a, a um, a section of my book when I was talking about where where Egypt is, where the activists in Egypt are likely to go, and one of the points I made is that it's very likely that whether Egypt becomes an Islamist state or an authoritarian state or a real democracy, you're very likely to see these same 10, 20,000 activists still protesting in Tahrir Square um, because they feel alienated from the system, whatever the system is, and what they're good at is protesting. And I remember asking some of these guys, um, well, you know, what, you know, what's your strategy? What are you trying to achieve by going out and protesting? And they basically said, well, there is no strategy. This is what we do. We do it well. We're the conscience of the revolution. We're the voice of the people. We're not trying to win votes. We're not trying to accomplish anything in particular. We're doing what we do. It's more of an expression of identity rather than an instrumental strategy. And I, I thought that was a pretty good answer. Um, you know, why, why would you want to turn me into a second-rate 
uh, you know, parliamentary subcommittee administrator when I can be a first rate, uh, you know, activist and voice of the people. And I, so I think there's something, something to that as well, the cultivation of a distinct activist identity, protest identity. Mark, maybe I will ask it if there's if there's no objection. Okay, but I'll ask you or something. Oh, I'll ask him later at dinner. Yeah. What do you rate the chances of uh, civil war in Egypt? Depends what you mean by civil war. Where? Um, I think that uh, what he said. What are the chances of civil war in Egypt? Um, I don't see it as likely as like a civil war, like a Syria style civil war. Um, but I think like the emergence of a protracted low-level insurgency along the 1990s level as not unlikely at all, probably above 50% at this point. Sorry. Right. <laughs> 